Welcome to the Hobby Hour. I'm Jim Granado, Dean of the Hobby School of Public Affairs. Before we start our program, this is a reminder to please share any questions you have for our speaker via the platform you're using to watch the show. We'll take audience questions and comments toward the end of the discussion. Joining me on today's show is author and Emmy Award-winning producer and writer Stephen Fenberg. Stephen Fenberg is the award-winning author of Unprecedented Power, Jesse Jones, Capitalism and the Common Good, the biography about the legendary Jesse H. Jones, Jones, the man who throughout the Great Depression, World War II, was reputedly the most powerful person in the nation next to President Roosevelt. Stephen Fenberg was also the executive producer and co-wrote Brother, Can You Spare a Billion? aptly titled. The Emmy Award-winning documentary, documentary film about Jesse Jones and it's narrated by Walter Cronkite and broadcast nationally on PBS. In addition to producing books, films, and exhibitions, Stephen Fenberg gives presentations and publishes articles and editorials primarily about employing the power of good governments to address today's daunting challenges. He frequently uses as models Jesse Jones and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, a topic we'll be talking about extensively today. The New Jersey, New, it was the New Deal agency that Jones chaired and saved that then saved the U.S. economy during the Great Depression and militarized industry in time to fight and win World War II. Stephen Fenberg, welcome to the Hobby Hour. Thank you so much. I'm honored and delighted to be here today to talk about one of my favorite topics, Jesse Jones and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and how its successful strategies can be adapted today to solve some of our own daunting challenges. So before we get to that, could you tell us a little bit about Jesse Jones, where he was from, and how he rose to such a, an, you know, impactful person? I, I'll be glad to. Uh, he was born in rural Tennessee on his father's very successful tobacco farm, and I remember a story he would tell frequently about his father keeping the smokehouse doors open so struggling neighbors could come in and you know help themselves to some meat or whatever if you know they needed help. But his Aunt Nancy, who took care of the children, would make sure she saw who took what so she could get these loans repaid. And he says that's where he learned the value that a loan is better than a handout. Uh, he had a very privileged background. He moved to Texas in 1894 to Dallas to work for his uncle, M.T. Jones, uh, who had a vast estate, a vast uh, lumber empire. He had the sawmills, timberland, stores to sell the uh, finished products. They called him back then a double ender. And when just when M.T. Jones passed away in 1898, Jesse Jones moved to Houston at the age of 24 to be one of the executors of the estate. Amazing. So now before we get to the questions, I want to find out a little about you. So you're from you're from. Houston originally? Born and raised here in Houston. And coincidentally, uh, my family's first store was in a building on Capitol and Travis, where the Chase Tower now stands. It was a two floor building. And uh, it was a building built in 1914 by Jesse Jones. And I grew up in downtown Houston. I went to the movie theaters he built, the uh, Metropolitan, the Lowe's. And little did I know that, you know, I would one day be his biographer. So you, your background is such that you became interested in this. Was this something that was a, just a passion you developed over time? Or was, was this something that you, you want to do when you were so high to the no, ground? I, I mean, I had no idea who Jesse Jones was. I saw his name on buildings, but I didn't really have any idea who he was. Uh, I was in my family's business, but I was interested in writing and started writing articles for newspapers and magazines, and they kept publishing them, and I liked that very much, and decided at one point to go out from the business and become a writer. And in 1993, uh, Houston Endowment, the philanthropic foundation that Joneses had established in 1937, in 93, they hired me to write a biographical sketch about Jesse Jones. Uh, for the foundation's annual report. Coincidentally, the Houston Endowment's offices were in the Chase Tower on that same block of land where I grew up. So I felt like I was going home. I mean, the continuity in my life here is really quite remarkable that that one block of land has been in my life almost forever. 
but I was going to be there for three months to write this biographical sketch. And then I discovered who Jesse Jones was that like you had said earlier, he was the most powerful person in the nation next to Roosevelt throughout the Great Depression and World War II. And what captivated me about him was that he was initiating and managing these massive New Deal agencies that were basically stabilizing the economy, helping all of the citizens, the, the nation's businesses. And they were making money for the federal government and the taxpayers at the same time. And I thought, well, wait a second, why aren't we looking at this today? This is amazing. Mm -hmm. So that's really why I got hooked. So I was gonna be at Houston Endowment for three months and I ended up staying for 20 years. Wow. So let's talk about Jesse Jones then. So you already talked a little bit about, about what he was doing, but just basically, what did he do? So, so when he moved to Houston, I mean, that was really an influence on his life, not only his background at the Tennessee tobacco farm, where he lived a life of privilege. He saw that helping others benefited the entire community. He arrived in Houston in 1898 when only 40,000 people lived here. And everything back then was locally owned, the newspapers, the banks, the insurance companies. So the local leaders understood that they would prosper only if their community thrived. So they were constantly building their businesses and their community at the same time. And Jesse Jones embraced that uh, approach to capitalism and it served him very well. He you know, wanted to improve, you know, build his businesses, build his community because he knew he would prosper if his community thrived and he embraced that and you can see it in his local, national, and international activities. So he's appointed chair of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation by President Roosevelt. When did that happen? Uh, right after Roosevelt was inaugurated. Jesse Jones had been one of, I want to give a little credit to Herbert Hoover here, because in 1932, Hoover established the RFC. It was, it's ironic that it was the first of the New Deal alphabet agencies that was started by a Republican president. But we must give Hoover credit for doing that. It's interesting for context to understand that the federal budget in 1932 was four billion dollars. That's less than a hundred billion dollars today. And I say that because it shows how little we depended or relied on the government to solve our problems. But Hoover even began to understand that the federal government was the only agency that was large enough and powerful enough to address the calamity of the Great Depression. So instead of relying on charity and volunteerism, in 1932, he established the RFC to make loans to railroads, banks, and insurance companies, thinking that that would restore confidence and stabilize the economy. That Jesse Jones would later recall, and I think this is so important as we grapple with the role of government today, he was uh, 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 on the original board of the RFC, but he said later it was entirely too timid and slow. And here's the important thing. He said, if five to seven billion dollars had been judiciously loaned in 1931 and 1932, the worst of the Great Depression would have been avoided. And I think that's so important today. I mean, that's that's the value of history. If we can look back and see the successes of the past, we can apply them to our issues today. So one, I think an example of something that's been done or had recently, more recently been done that models itself after the RFC is the TARP program. Is that correct? That's exactly right. So in 1933, Jones becomes chairman of the RFC. The banks are closed when Roosevelt becomes president. I mean, the financial system had completely collapsed. So the emergency of, I can't remember the exact name of the legislation, but within five days of Roosevelt's inauguration, legislation was passed. And one of the provisions allowed the RFC to begin buying preferred stock in banks. Instead of making loans to banks, which just put them further into debt, buying their preferred stock, raised their capital, and gave them more money to lend. Well, the bankers were very reluctant to uh, participate in this program. I mean, again, remember, this is 1933. The government, you know, was not as involved in the private sector as it is today or as accepted as it is today by some. 
so, uh, but so Roosevelt put Jesse Jones uh, out on the front line to promote this program. So he would go on the radio in between like Fanny Bryce and Jack Benny and promote the uh, RFC's program to buy preferred stock and bank. And he would go to the American Bankers Association's meeting and said, you've got to bring, you've got to participate because if you don't, the federal government's going to have to step in. So finally, the banks started to sell their preferred stock to the RFC and the banks were able to reopen. They were also able to qualify for FDIC insurance, which was also a new program. But the RFC was the one that had to make sure that the banks were qualified to participate. And, and Jones said, for those banks that aren't qualified to participate, give me 60 days and I'll get them into shape so that we can have all the banks participating in this vital program to stabilize the economy. And just as almost everything else that Jones did through the RFC, all that preferred stock was bought back or returned to the banks. And no bank was nationalized during that time. And the federal government made money on the program, just like TARP did uh, in 2008. Uh, only in 2008, it was not a voluntary program, whereas in 1933, Jones had to convince the bankers to participate. But it even furthered the power of the RFC because here these bankers now had all this money and they could lend it. And the, the wheels of the economy were frozen. But Jesse Jones was a master at the use of credit. And he understood that's what it would take to lubricate the economy and to get it going again. So he said to the bankers, he said, if you don't start lending that money, the federal government through the RFC will have to become the lender of last resort. And that's precisely what happened. And that's when the RFC really did take off to stabilize and expand the economy. What relationship did the RFC have with the Federal Reserve? Was there? Uh, its, its offices were all in all the uh, Federal Reserve branch banks, uh, but it was very independent from the Federal Reserve. It was its own agency. It, it basically had its own power of the purse, and that's what gave it so much power and Jesse Jones so much power because all of its programs were – very successful and made money for the federal government and for the RFC. So the RFC had its own bank account. And oftentimes Roosevelt would turn to Jesse Jones and the RFC if he wanted to get something done that he knew he would have a problem getting through Congress because Jones basically had his own power of the purse. And that's what gave him so much power. And that's why all the media, all the, the magazines, the newspapers, you know, called him the fourth branch of government, the most powerful person in the nation next to Roosevelt. So who is he accountable to? Just the president? Obviously, Congress in some sense, you have to testify. But in terms of making these decisions, did he, I mean, it sounds like he had more power than the chair of the Federal Reserve has. And I, I guess that's why he called him the second most powerful man in the country, because it Correct. seems to me the discretion he had enormous discretion to just make these choices, and he must have had some type of group of wise men and wise women around him to take, you know, make suggestions. I'm thinking, um, well, which is just one man show. And and you know, this is something I, I like to say, you know, because people say, "How did this man get so much done?" Because uh, I was curious about that too. I said, "How can one human being run these enormous businesses in Houston, Texas, and then run this enormous agency for the federal government?" And he was able to delegate. He would find the best person for the job or the best people for the job. He'd give them the job and he'd step away. He would not micromanage. So it was all about finding talent and delegating it to them. But basically, he really did have the final word on how the money was spent, of course, in conjunction with Franklin Roosevelt, whose approval he turned to for everything. And the archives you know, uh, that are now at Rice University, it's fascinating to see the correspondence between the two men and how casual they were. And, you know, Jesse Jones would send a little note to uh, Roosevelt about wanting to create this program. And Roosevelt, something to write, approved FDR and send it back. And that was about the end of it. Things were very casual and formal back in those days. And, and I hope we get a, a chance to talk about some of the programs that the RFC initiated and managed because they have great potential for today. Why don't we turn to that right now? Okay, I would be glad to. <laughs> you know, two things that, that come to mind, they're two, my two favorite programs, is the Rural Electrification Administration and the Electric Home Farm Authority. 
So in the 1930s only, and this is so relevant as we, we want to spread broadband access around the nation, here's the way we could do it. So uh, in the 1930s, about 20% of the people who lived in the country had power. 80% did not, they lived in the dark. And this is the 1930s, not all that long ago. So the REA, the Rural Electrification Administration, one of many subsidiaries of the RFC, um, made deals with utility companies, created co-ops to comprehensively spread infrastructure, the, the, the means of transmission throughout the nation and allowed people to plug into the modern age. But here it was the Great Depression and people didn't have money to go out and buy toasters, radios, fans, and pumps. So the RFC started the Electric Home Farm Administration and it made it, uh, here, let me see if I can sum it up. So let's say a farmer got electricity to his house for the first time. He would go into an appliance store and he'd buy a fan, toaster, water pump, refrigerator, and the RFC would reimburse the merchant for those purchases. And the power company that was selling the new power to the new customer would put a small monthly charge with a little bit interest into the uh, monthly bill and then would uh, advance those proceeds to the RFC. And in the end, the program was uh, abolished in 1943 because it had basically outlived its useful life. And that's another feature of the RFC. Nothing was meant to be there in perpetuity. It was to serve a purpose and then be ended. But by the time it ended in 1943, uh, the, the Electric Home Farm Authority had helped millions of families buy appliances for their new power. And as Jesse Jones said, when it was finally closed down, he said, and it returned a tidy profit to the federal government. So I bring up this because this is the way we could spread broad brand, broadband access throughout the nation, rebuild the transmission infrastructure, help people retrofit their homes and their businesses so they're energy efficient, storm resistant, and wired for the modern age, all through lending, not spending. And that's what differentiates the RFC from all the other New Deal agencies it was a lending institution, not a spending institution. One question, and those of us who are in political science, we're always looking for something called distributive politics. So, and that's political forces are very ever present about how money is dispersed. And geographically, you see it, for example, interest groups, I mean, it's, it's part of our system. How did he insulate the RFC from those pressures? Good question. Uh, first of all, he made the RFC, I can't always say he because it was the RFC, but it was under his management. Uh, the RFC made loans to every congressional district in the United States. So everybody liked him. And that that's really what it boils down to. And also because he operated in a goldfish bowl, everything the RFC did was completely transparent. Jesse Jones was on the radio, in the newspapers, in magazines all the time. And whenever he met a, made a presentation, he would make a report about the RFC's activities. And he would um, present three figures, how much the RFC had loaned, how much it had been repaid, and how much the RFC had to then donate to spending programs like the WPA and the PWA, because the RFC was so incredibly successful, it was able to finance the spending programs, which is another good reason for us to take a look at a new infrastructure bank today and how it can address our problems. And as a matter of fact, there is a bill in Congress, HR 3339, to create a bank that's modeled on the RFC. And it's had many uh, state legislatures have passed uh, resolutions to endorse the plan and many uh, city councils, county governments, uh, and all kinds of other organizations have endorsed the plan. It's HR 3339. And it is set up to lend up to $5 trillion to rebuild infrastructure, just like the RFC did. Amazing. So, and, there, and there's so many applications that we can look at from the Depression era RFC. 
for instance, we talk about high speed trains. Uh, railroads were, if not the largest, one of the largest employers and taxpayers in the nation in the 1930s. And more than half of them were in bankruptcy or something like that. I mean, it was just, you know, an awful mess. So again, the RFC intervened with lending, not spending, and it helped the railroads refinance their debt as the lender of last resort. If the banks wanted to lend, you know, refinance their debt, the RFC said, well, we can come in at 4%. What's your best bet? And, you know, so oftentimes they would get the banks to lower their rates and help, you know, revitalize the rails. Uh, the RFC also made loans to railroads to help them develop the latest in high speed trains, which is something we talk about today. And all these monies were eventually returned to the federal government because they were loans. They weren't bailouts, which, you know, is whenever I hear the word bailouts, I think, oh, my God, why aren't we talking about making loans instead of bailouts or helping them refinance their debt? And I also want to make this point. The RFC always gave the private sector first choice to participate in these programs. It wanted to collaborate with banks, with businesses. Uh, it did not want to be the standalone lender. But oftentimes, uh, the private sector was either unwilling or unable to participate because what needed to be done was massive. And I go back to this idea about the power of government. There are certain things that only the government is powerful enough and big enough to do. And I think it's the patriotic thing to, to embrace the power of good government. Or as Jesse Jones said in 1937 about economic recovery, it cannot happen if we allow ourselves to believe that government is our enemy. This seems like an interesting hybrid because when you think this, all the, all the rage in the 30s and even beyond, in fact, the debate still goes on today, um, is about centralized planning, public ownership. And this is this is not that. I mean, it's it's this is strictly you're working with the private sector. I and mean, there could be some criticism, I guess, level about you're, you're making decisions. But even here, I think you're saying it's not true. The private sector makes the decision about what they want to do and the money is supplied. Is that correct? So. Right. That's the idea of I mean, planning from on top is not there. You don't have top down. It's bottom up where the, the, you know, the vast amount of information that's out there that people in local areas know best, they still get to do what they need to do. That's, that's correct. I mean, the RFC would see the problem and come up with solutions, but it would always include the private sector first. Do you want to participate in this? We see that railroads need to refinance their debt or it's going to be a catastrophe catastrophe for everybody. So here's what we are able to do. Can you match this? Do you want to participate in developing high speed trains? If you don't, we must. Uh, it was essential to restore the economy and there, there really was no choice about it. I, I want to say another thing about these loans, you know, uh, there were always qualifications to them. For instance, with the railroad loans, if a railroad took a loan, it could not pay dividends to shareholders until the loans were repaid. Executives had to, uh, Roosevelt wanted to say, no executive getting an RFC loan can make more than the president of the United States. But Jesse Jones, that, that's not nearly enough. They're not gonna be able to support their big mansions and their big boats on what President Roosevelt makes. So he negotiated and he says, I think we can do better than that, but we must cap your salary if you're gonna take an RFC loan. And if your railroad line is in California, that's where you need to live, not next to your Wall Street banker in New York. Right. Right. So 18 months before Pearl Harbor, the RFC starts to shift its focus, which is very interesting because the United States in the late 30s, it's there's so many um, books, articles on how unprepared we were, how the public, in fact, a substantial part of our military was anti-Brit, not anti-German. Um, you had relationships between Ford and GM and Hitler in terms of building war material, tanks and whatnot. And so all of a sudden, was it Jesse Jones? Who was it that said, wait a second, this is coming? Even conscription was a controversial, very controversial. Um, so we have this, this situation where the people are not prepared. They don't want to deal with this threat. 
but the RFC starts to take the lead. So was that Jones idea? Or was there, was he working with a group that said, we need to change what we're doing domestically and start focusing on our war making abilities? I think it was Franklin Roosevelt who knew what was coming, but his hands were tied because as you said, there was great opposition to entering the war unless the United States was directly attacked. I think 80% of the population was against intervening unless we were attacked. There was also the Neutrality Acts, which forbid the United States from selling arms to warring nations. But here's Roosevelt turning to Jesse Jones because what he couldn't get through Congress, he could get the RFC to do because Jesse Jones had his own power of the purse. So he turned to Jesse Jones 18 months before the Pearl Harbor attacks Jones and said, you're the one who has to go to Congress to ask for this because you're more able to get something done through them than I am. So in June 1940, I think it was, he went before Congress and he came away and said, they gave us the dictionary is the way he said it. And that legislation that was passed allowed the RFC to buy, build, and accumulate anything that was required to fight and win World War II. When that happened, our military ranked 17th in the world in terms of its size. But within a matter of months of that legislation, we became the arsenal of democracy. And it was through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and Jesse Jones's leadership that that happened. So let's, let's drill down a little bit more. How did RFC transform industry in time to fight and win World War II? With billions of dollars. Uh, so it's, it's kind of hard to sum it up because it's so fast. But the first point I want to make is that their efforts were comprehensive. And again, and I think about, you know, how we can apply these strategies today. I thought about this when the pandemic started to arise. I thought, oh, if only we had a central thing like the RFC to do everything that was required, just like it did to mobilize for World War II. So in 1940, the RFC began building enormous factories to manufacture tanks, ships, trucks, airplanes. It started accumulating and manufacturing aluminum, magnesium, rubber, silk for, for parachutes, wool for uniforms. Like I'm saying, everything was comprehensive. One of its biggest focuses was aviation because I think, you know, we had about 2,500 airplanes that were left over from World War I and uh, the Germans had 9,000, the Japanese had 7,500 and Roosevelt said, we need to build 50,000 airplanes a year. And that's exactly what the RFC ended up doing. It invested millions and millions of dollars building factories to, to accumulate and to build all these things and at least them to corporations to operate. And again, this is such an interesting fact of history as we talk about the power of government, because some people today would think that's socialism. But Jesse Jones and Roosevelt were not ideologues. They, they, their main concern was to preserve democracy and capitalism, and they did anything that was necessary to do it, even owning the means of production and, and leasing it to corporations to operate, which is exactly what happened, and it was tremendously successful. Yeah, I mean, I worked in Michigan for a number of years, and I remember driving by Willow Run. Um, that building was a mile long, and I think a quarter mile wide, and that's where they built the B-24 Liberators. They're that's making right. one an hour yeah. right, when they peaked. I and mean, it was just, I mean, the volume of what we did is just unbelievable. I mean, we're- I mean, I, do those things again today. Yeah. I think, you know, if we will embrace the power of good government and, and realize that, that it's not our enemy, we can do those monumental things again, just like we did back then. And the need was there, because I think you mentioned that, that the RFC- invested 10 times more than private industry could or would. Is that correct? In aviation alone. Oh. I mean, it built it built over 520 plants to build airplanes and the engines. But again, I'm going to say it was so comprehensive. They formed um, schools to train aviators. They accumulated wool for uniforms. They accumulated silk for parachutes. They manufactured high-octane gas 
uh, one of the first thing it did was start building machine tools because you can't have mass production without gauges and lathes and measuring devices. Uh, it, everything would have to be handmade. So the first thing it did was start investing in making machine tools. So that's what I'm saying. It was all comprehensive, which is such a model for today as we address our own difficult situations like semiconductors or rare earth metals, these things that are so vital to what we need today. We need to look at how the RFC responded to the needs of World War II uh, so that it became the arsenal of democracy. I heard President Biden say some time ago that he wanted to vaccinate the world, and it reminded me of being the arsenal of democracy. If we would implement the kinds of strategies that they implemented in World War II, we could be the vaccinator of the world. Speaking of comprehensiveness, it was even, I mean, synthetic rubber, because that was manufactured in another part of the world, which the Japanese were um, occupying at the time. Um, but that was just yet another thing that that was evolved from this. And, and it's really, it was very influential on the Houston economy, not that that was Jones's intention. Uh, we were relying on natural rubber for everything until the Japanese overtook our primary sources in the Pacific Ocean. But thank goodness Jones and the RFC had started 18 months before in 1940 to develop synthetic rubber from the lab to mass production. And if they had not done that and been successful at it, the Allied forces basically would have been stuck in place and unable to fight. But those plants were located along the Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coast because of the proximity to oil uh, shipping, and they weren't on the more vulnerable and Atlantic and Pacific coasts. And it just spurred the Houston economy. You know, I think that uh, the population from the 1940s to the 1950s almost doubled from about 400,000 to 700,000. But this massive industrial investment that the federal government had made during World War II was spread out throughout the nation. Uh, it was the policy for security's sake as well. But all of this that was built by the government and leased to corporations to operate was sold after the war. They started planning reconversion during the 1940s before World War II was even over because they knew how important it was to get this capacity and this power out of the government hands and back into the private sector. So it's important to, to know that Jones, Roosevelt, they had no desire to nationalize anything. They wanted to save democracy and save capitalism. They didn't care how they did it. You know, even if you wanted to call it socialism, that's how it was done and it worked. And it expanded our economy. And that's why we had this growth in the middle class right after World War II, up until the uh, 1970s. I want to ask one more question about this issue, and I'm curious I mean, how the reach of RFC. So we're, we're talking about how compre you're talking about how comprehensive this all is. Well, we had in 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 Houston or in Texas, we had we had to transport oil by pipelines because the government was afraid that the, if we did it by shipping, the ships would be sunk. So they had, was a big inch and little inch, I believe. That's correct. Was, that, was, yes, RFC, yes, was exactly RFC involved correct. with that yeah. too? That they built them, sure. Oh, I mean, it, the, the, the reach of the RFC was monumental. It had it, its hands in every phase of the economy and the country and the industry. It built the big inch and little inch pipelines to transport uh, oil and gas from the Gulf Coast to the East Coast because uh, doing it by train was prohibitive and the ships were getting sunk in the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's pivot a little bit. Um, let's focus on Houston. How did Jesse Jones partner with government to develop Houston? And what was his attitude about government? I think you've already alluded to that, but if you want to come back to that too, but I think- yeah, I'm glad to because, because I mean, it, it's from the very beginning of the time he came to Houston uh, to manage his uncle M.T. Jones's lumber empire. Uh, Jones also went into the lumber business, but he extended M.T.'s double-ender status by one leap. He started using the lumber to construct small houses in what we now call Midtown. So he went to the Houston city government because back then, Tuam, Chenever, you know, McGowan, all those streets, they were mud. So Jones went to the, to the city government and he couldn't afford to pave it, or they called it grade and gravel back then. Uh, 
the streets, but he thought, well, maybe the city can you know, partner with me. So we went to the city of Houston and said, I'll pay half if you pay the other half to grade and gravel these streets. I will build small houses there and sell them on unique long-term installment plans so people with modest means can afford to buy a home. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. That same strategy was used later uh, with a delegation that went to the United States Congress to ask them to pay for half the cost of dredging the Houston Ship Channel. And it became known as the Houston Plan because it was one of the first programs where the federal government and a municipal government or the people of the city combined to create infrastructure. And I think it was uh, Tom Ball, that's you know, the, the uh, city of Tom Ball, the Congressman uh, Ball went, to, went there. I think he was a representative, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, he went up there and he got Congress to agree to pay half the cost. They came back, they went to Jesse Jones, who was kind of the go-to guy for anything that needed to happen big in Houston uh, because they needed to sell navigation bonds, but people didn't know what they were. So Jones went to all his fellow bankers. He said, this is the best investment we could make in Houston's development. And within 24 hours, he had raised Houston's half the funds to build the Houston Chip Channel. And he was the first chairman of the Houston Harbor Board. And in that role, he uh, developed all the piers and wharves that would welcome ships from around the world to the port of Houston, which has become one of our greatest economic engines. And it is a great example of how partnerships with the federal government can do improve life for everybody. Right. What else did Jesse Jones do to develop Houston? God, so many things, you know, besides being a builder, I mean, he built the city's tallest skyscrapers, its most ornate movie theaters, its most lavish hotels. Uh, but something that, that people don't know much about Jesse Jones is that he was a great supporter of the performing arts. He had traveled in Europe as a young man with his Aunt Louisa after M.T. Jones had died. And he realized a great city needed great art. So in the, about 1910, he went to the city and said, we need to have an auditorium in Houston that can house conventions and performing arts organizations. And he was Edna Saunders' biggest backer. And Edna Saunders is a forgotten figure in Houston history who I think really deserves to be remembered and honored. She was the city's impresario and she would bring performing arts organizations from around the world to Houston. Uh, to perform, but they had no place to do it. So the city auditorium, uh, Jesse Jones was the building chairman, was opened in 1910. And, and we had, you know, the greatest performers uh, in, in there because of Edna Saunders and Jesse Jones. Um, and it is it stood where Jesse H. Jones Hall for the Performing Arts stands today, which was built in 1966. Before Jesse Jones passed away, he told his nephew, John T. Jones Jr., who took over from Jones when he passed away, he said, remember, John, Houston needs a better performing arts center. Jesse Jones passed away in 1956, and John T. Jones Jr., as uh, chairman of Houston Endowment, went before city council in 1962 and said, we would like to build and give to the city of Houston a performing arts hall, a first class performing arts hall. And indeed that's how Jesse H. Jones Hall for the Performing Arts came about. And it became home to the Houston Grand Opera, the Houston Symphony, the Houston Ballet and the Society for the Performing Arts. And it gave them all a fertile foundation from which to grow. And so I'm saying all this to, you know, you had asked me about, you know, what else did Jesse Jones do to develop Houston? He was really, very responsible for the robust performing arts we have in Houston today in a very indirect way, but certainly uh, influential. I do want to mention, so or ask you about the the convention in 19 in Houston in 1928. Um, okay. Because um, I think he was chair of the, the, the um, Democratic National Committee, correct? Uh, he, was chair, he was the finance chair of the Democratic National Committee from 1924 to 1928. 
and the party was constantly in debt. And so he was able to alleviate the party's debt. They were very grateful to him because for the first time in many, many years, they were able to start the 28 campaign uh, with no debt. And so the myth is, and I'm not sure if it's true or not, is that he, you know, when they met to decide where they should have the convention in January, which again is also interesting to see how things have changed. Yeah. Today, we decide two years before where the convention should be, and it costs millions and millions of dollars to produce. Back then, they would decide in January where to hold the convention in June, which is exactly what happened. And so the myth is that he put a blank check on the table and said, fill her in for whatever it takes. I'm not sure if that's really what happened, but that's the story. Uh, and I think it's more because of what he did to erase the party's persistent and debilitating debt that he was able to capture the 1928 convention for Houston. And it was the first convention like that to be held in the South since before the Civil War. And it was one of the first to be widely received over radio. So it put Houston on the map and Jesse Jones in the spotlight. Now, the thing was here, he offered to you know host this convention in Houston, but we had no hall big enough to seat 25,000 delegates who were about to come to this city of 300,000 people. So he said, no worry, I'll build a building. And indeed he did. He built the Sam Houston Hall uh, where the Hobby Center for the Performing Arts now stands today. And it was ready in time to welcome these 25,000 people who came to town who couldn't help but notice the, the towering golf building that he was building. It was Houston's tallest building and it was just about to be complete in 1929. It was 35 floors. And it was Houston's tallest building uh, from the time it opened until 1963 when Humble Oil opened its own building, uh, and I think it was 44 floors at Maine uh, and Bell. But, you know, you couldn't help but notice this thing just towering above all the other buildings. But, of course, it opened right as the stock market crashed and ushered in the Great Depression. So one other uh, remarkable fact about that, the convention, is how quickly he had the building built right yeah. i mean he had he had limited he had a short window to get it done don't worry i'll make it from scratch which is what he did yeah yeah he so certainly did it was like 60 it was some incredibly short i mean i think 60 days yeah right? yeah, yeah i think so okay um i i'd like to ask one question about him did okay. he ever fail at anything that's a good question. And and as I, I told you earlier before we started the interview, it was hard for me to write this the book uh, about him because I didn't want it to be a puff piece, but I couldn't find anything bad to write about the guy. He was a man of integrity and honor. And as I said, you know, he operated the RFC in a goldfish bowl. He invited reporters to follow him around and watch him do what he did. Um, so... You know, in this day and age, I guess we're always trying to find, we can't have heroes, you know, where we can't have leaders. We're always trying to find the smallest thing to criticize them about. But he was a nice guy and, and people liked him. They called him Uncle Jess throughout the nation. That's how he was known because he was very folksy and warm and simple and unpretentious. And he only wanted to save capitalism and democracy. And that showed. Uh, his intentions were honorable. He was not an ideologue. He was an open, honest, warm human being. And people liked him. Uh, he, he, the left and the right, Republicans and Democrats embraced him and embraced the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Uh, he liked to gamble. He liked to play cards. He liked to drink. He liked to tell jokes. But there's nothing wrong with any of those things. He was a fun guy. And you mentioned the Claytons, the Joneses and the Claytons played bridge together two or three nights a week. And Will Clayton, who was very responsible for uh, authoring the Marshall Plan, uh, Jones brought Clayton into government in 1940 as the assistant federal loan administrator. That was Jones's official title, federal loan administrator, because he had all the lending agencies under his umbrella. Uh, he brought Clayton into the government in 1940 to oversee the accumulation of strategic materials from around the world. And part of that program was preemptive to keep the materials out of enemy hands. 
And the other part was because they were required to build this military infrastructure uh, that, you know, is now second to none. Did he ever consider running for public office? In 1940, uh, he was touted as Roosevelt's vice president, as his running mate. And he did consider it until, uh, in fact, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, endorsed that idea. And he was considering it until uh, Roosevelt made it clear that he wanted uh, Henry Wallace to be his running mate. And so then he withdrew his name from consideration. But really, he had more power as chairman of the RFC than he would ever have had, except if he was president of the United States. Wasn't he? Henry- was, he was later uh, in 1940. Uh, Roosevelt was starting to be a little leery of Jones's power and thought maybe he could control him a little bit more if he had him in his cabinet. So he invited Jones to join the cabinet as Secretary of Commerce in 1940. And Jones said, yeah, sure, I'll do it as long as I can stay in charge of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and be federal loan administrator. And because Jones was so universally liked that Roosevelt then had no choice but to make him Secretary of Commerce and let him stay federal loan administrator. And it required uh, a resolution by Congress to allow one person to hold two jobs at the same time. And it was unanimously passed by Congress to allow him to do that. So by 1940, he was also, he was federal loan administrator and Secretary of Commerce. At some point, Roosevelt and and Jones have a falling out, and I believe Henry Wallace was the reason. Can you tell us about that? Uh, Henry Wallace and Jones were diametrically opposed when it came to government policy. I'll go back to 1933. Henry, there was uh, they were trying to figure out ways to reduce supply uh, because the the markets were saturated. There was not enough buying power. There wasn't enough demand. Exactly the opposite of what we've got today. Uh, We have not enough supply and too much demand. But back then, too much supply, not enough demand. And corn, wheat, all those things, they were were just, you know, farmers were going bankrupt because they couldn't get enough for their their crops. So Wallace said we should have farmers plow under a third of their crops and kill a third of their pigs. And they did that, and it did not work. And Jones thought that was a crazy scheme, especially because he grew up on a farm. Rather, he used the power of credit and started the Commodity Credit Corporation, which would take a farmer's crops and make loan. Like, let's say somebody had a whole bunch of wheat. They would bring the wheat to the CCC, to the warehouse of the CCC, and the CCC would then give a loan to the farmer. So the farmer had money to live on and would hold the crop. And they were with, you know, bringing in all these crops and it was slowly lifting up the prices uh, because it was diminishing supply. The farmers then could sell their crops at a profit. And this was an enormously successful program, so much so that when Wallace became Secretary of Agriculture in the late 1930s, he wanted the CCC in his portfolio and not in the RFC. And that's exactly what he got. So when um, Roosevelt wanted Wallace to be his vice president, and that's, you know, that happened in 1940. In 1944, the Democratic Party said, no, we don't want Henry Wallace to be your running mate. You've got to pick somebody else. And that's how Harry Truman came to be. So Roosevelt had to say to Wallace, I'm sorry, you can't be my running mate, but you can have any other position in the federal government except for Secretary of State. And of course, by then, because of Jones's dual role, the Secretary of Commerce had become the most powerful cabinet position besides Secretary of State and because it included the RFC. So Wallace said, I want to be Secretary of Commerce. And that's indeed what happened. But Congress removed the RFC from the Commerce Department, put it in the Treasury Department before they would uh, approve Wallace's nomination. But the way Roosevelt fired Jones left a very bad taste in Jones's mouth because basically he was just kicked out. Uh, in 19, uh, well, the day of the presidential inauguration, Jones went to the inauguration with Governor Hobby, who was one of his closest friends, and he was That's his right. guest with, uh, mm-hmm. with Jones. And uh, they went to the inauguration. Jones goes back to the Shoreham Hotel where he lived with Governor Hobby, and he received the note from Roosevelt firing him as Secretary of Commerce. 
Yeah, Governor Hobby's told me about that story. It's it's quite well. Sad. Governor Bill Hobby yeah. was with his mother standing yeah. on a roof of a hotel watching the inauguration while Jones and his father, the Governor uh, William Hobby, were together. Yeah. And yes, he's told me that story too. Yeah, yeah, I, I, he's. <laughs> He said, "Not the a good day." Joneses were. I mean, the hobby. You know, Jones played cards with the hobbies. They were all very close. Well, that, that would, let's. I'd like to focus on that if it's okay with you. Um, the hobbies and Jesse Jones were close. I mean, particularly um, um, Will yes. and Jesse Jones. Yes. And I mean, so Jesse Jones provided him the credit to purchase the Houston Post. Isn't that correct? The, Jones took over. Jones owned the Houston Chronicle, but in 1933 he took over the Houston Post because Governor Ross Sterling uh, was in financial problem, and so as collateral for a loan, Jones took over the Houston Post from Governor Sterling, and he owned it for some number of years, and then financed the purchase of the Post to the the Hobby family. And if I remember right, we, at, at the beginning of this program, you talked about. Uh, Jones had, in the, uh, if you got a loan from the RC, you could not give stock options. You couldn't give dividends. And so but I, I recall Governor Hobby told me that they had, he would not let them take a salary off the loan until they made a, pro if I remember, they paid it back. So they Is had to get, right? they get credit from the Frost Bank in Dallas to, to tie them over during this transition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. They also used to meet in a hotel, right? The, 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 uh, that, that was really after Jones's time. That's Suite 8F in the Lamar Hotel, where the next generation met to mm -hmm. determine the future of the city of Houston. Uh, J the Joneses lived, that was one of Jones's hotel, the Lamar Hotel. He, he built and owned that in 1926. Mm -hmm. And the Joneses lived in the penthouse on the top floor of the Lamar Hotel. They never had a house. They always lived in hotels. Uh, and as John T. Was it John T. Jones or it could have been Governor Hobby told me, that whenever they wanted to discuss something with Jesse Jones, they went up to him. He did not come down to them because by then he was the senior statesman. Yeah. The other thing that hobbies, they went on a plane flight together. Yeah. The three of them. Yes. The plane crashed. Yes. Uh, so, and I, the story I've been told is that uh, Governor Hobby's mother, Vita Culp Hobby, uh, the pilot was, co pilot was trapped. And she got him out before the fire engulfed him. I mean, just an amazing story. But I, I, the other thing is, in, in, in the Hobby family, um, the governor and, and Mrs. Hobby never flew on the same plane again. Really? I did not know that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know that one of the pilots was killed in that accident, and Jesse Jones supported the family for many years after that. There's a, a picture of Jones shaking the hand of the, of the little boy who was the son of the pilot who got killed. Yeah. So but Roosevelt was very concerned about that that accident because Jones was indispensable, and the and the correspondence between the two of them at that time is is very touching, uh, because Roosevelt wanted to make sure Jesse Jones was okay. Well, in your book, you have there's some correspondence after the incident in the Shoreham Hotel, right, and it, it becomes much more, if I recall, that he's quite angry and deservedly so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he, yeah. Was, I mean, he was just kind of kicked out of the government after yeah. everything he had done, uh, you know, with very little fanfare or appreciation. And uh, his colleagues, on the other hand, you know, had banquets for him, gave him a silver tray from Cartier engraved with all their names in it. I mean, they loved him. They loved Jesse Jones. Everybody who worked for Jesse Jones, listen to this. When he died, he left in his will a... a, a I can't remember the amount, but it was a substantial amount to be divided among all of his employees of the Jones interests. That's the kind of wow. guy he was. Wow. And this is in 1956. And, you know, the grants that they made through Houston Endowment, you know, everything I would read about him I, when I would discover it for the first time, I go, wow, I love this guy. So in 1946, when they're back in Houston, they're focusing on philanthropy. They're establishing scholarship programs throughout the state because they really believed that educational was, education was fundamental to a healthy society. But what's so nice about these scholarship programs in 1946, they were always divided equally between men and women and included minorities. They established a scholarship program in 1946 
at Prairie View A&M University when the South was still deeply segregated, but it was enough to send 10 girls and 10 boys to college with their books, room and board uh, for four or five years at a time. And then those, those programs were renewed every, you know, so often. But, you know, you ask me, you know, is there anything bad about the guy? Everything I would discover about him, I liked. Even back in 1918, when he's in Europe during World War I for the American Red Cross, he's writing to President uh, Wilson saying, women deserve to have military rank when they serve in the armed forces. They had no military rank. They had no authority. This was two years before women got the right to vote. And he's saying, he's lobbying the president. Women need to have military rank so that we can encourage them to pursue careers in law, medicine, and education. And his Houston Chronicle endorsed the women's right to vote in 1915. So, you know, everything I read about the guy, I like. <laughs> we have a question. We have questions from the audience. I want to... Um... It's from Julian, and he says, are there any significant development projects today, specifically Houston, that you think echoes the achievement of the RFC and Jesse Jones? Uh, I can say nationally, we have the Export-Import Bank. We have Fannie Mae for mortgages. These are enduring agencies that were initiated by the RFC in the 1930s. We have the petrochemical industry in Houston, Texas, because of the uh, development of synthetic rubber. I mean, that put uh, chemical into petrochemical uh, and that and it just it was an enormous impact on the city's economy. And uh, it, it, yeah, so I mean, it's everlasting. And there, there certainly are, oh, the San Jacinto Monument, if you want something that you can see. Uh, Jones was responsible for uh, placing the monument there because in 1936, he was chairman of the Texas Centennial Commission. And he, you know, he says, I don't want you know, like a bizarre, you no know, hoochie coochie festival. He says, I want monuments and art throughout the state to commemorate this significant battle. Uh, and so that's how the San Jacinto Monument came to be. Before we conclude, I want to ask you about you again. What okay. is your history with the University of Houston? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, the University of Houston, uh, Houston Public Television, was the originating station for Brother Can You Spare a Billion? And I believe it was the first documentary that was nationally broadcast on PBS that originated at KUHT. Uh, I really want to give a shout out to uh, former history professor Joe Pratt, who encouraged me with every one of my projects, whether it was the exhibit I did for Houston Endowment, oral history program, the book I wrote, uh, or the film I made. Joe Pratt was behind me all the way, and he was the one who got me to ask Texas A&M University Press to write the book uh, uh, Unprecedented Power. I have a copy of it here and I'm only gonna hold it up because I want to, to point out that these are two Democrats and former Secretary, uh, um, Secretary of State James Baker endorsed the book, a good Republican statesman who said a must read for those wanting to learn how a great nation and a great man can respond to difficult challenges. And I point this out not to tout my book, but to say there are strategies from our history that are successful and that can be adapted today to address our own daunting challenges. What else can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> I also noticed you mentioned uh, the Heine building. Well, two things. One yeah, is yeah, okay. So we'll talk. You know, the, as far as so that's Houston endowment history. Yeah. Fred Heine was Jesse Jones's close associate and had his power of attorney. Jesse Jones would call him his other self. So in the early 1950s, uh, Houston endowment through the Joneses made a grant to build the Fred Heine building in at the University of Houston to provide classrooms for the growing school. So, you know, whenever you pass by the Fred Heine building, you wonder who is that guy? He was Jesse Jones's closest associate who he considered to be his other self. And it was because of Fred Heine that Jesse Jones was able to be in Washington for as long as he was and to do what he did because Fred Heine managed everything in Houston for uh, Jesse Jones. 
Uh, Houston Endowment also uh, supplied nursing scholarships at the University of Houston when it had a nursing school because uh, Jones realized that the Texas Medical Center could not grow without an adequate supply of nurses. So among the many scholarship programs that it had established when they returned from Washington, D.C., was a nursing scholarship program at the University of Houston. Well, Stephen Feinberg, I want to thank you again for your insightful conversation, for being our guest today. It's been a real pleasure. And to our audience, we're grateful for you tuning in today and welcome, welcome you back to a new season of the Hobby Hour this fall. Stay tuned for more details on our next Hobby Hour in October and look for our, web, our website and social media platforms for the information. Again, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure.